Um, all right, so it's now 8 p.m. EST, so that means that our adroit, wonderful issue 48 release reading can begin. Um, hi, my name is Nshia Lee, and I am a prose editor at the Adroit Journal, and it is uh, with great pleasure that I am able to welcome you all to issue 48, which is about to be released very, very soon. Um, tonight, we have a truly wonderful lineup of readers, and so before we start, I would like to encourage everybody to react, to drop comments of appreciation into the chat box. Um, also, feel free to uh, turn on your video cameras and express appreciation that way as well. We just do kindly ask that if you are not a reader tonight, that you please remain muted so that we're able to hear our wonderful readers better. Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, my last remark before we begin is that I would like to extend a round of thanks to the entire Droid team for working so hard on bringing the issue. And also, finally, thank you to all of the attendees, all of the readers of Adroit um, who have gathered with us here tonight to celebrate the reading. Um, we also really, really, really appreciate all of you. Um, yeah, great. So now it is my job to introduce each of our wonderful readers. So... I'm um, going to kick this off, kicking off tonight. We are going to start with Cyrus Cassell. So is there room for another horse on your horse ranch? Four-Way Books, March 2024, is Cyrus Cassell's ninth and latest volume. Everything in Life is Resurrection, Selected Poems, 1982 to 20, 2022, TCU Press, and Lorca to the Umpteenth Power, Three at House Press, are forthcoming in 2025 and 2026. He served as the 2021 to 22 Poet Laureate of Texas, among his honors, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Lambda Literary Award, and the Poetry Society of America's William Carlos Williams Award. The World That the Shooter Left Us, 2022, was a Housatonic Book Award finalist and The Gospel According to Wild Indigo 2018, a finalist for the NAACP Image Award. Still Life with Children, selected poems of Francesque uh, Parcerisas, yes, Trent the right. Catalan, yeah, <laughs> right. was awarded the Texas Institute of Letters Soret Deal Fraser Award for Best Translated Book of 2018 and 2019. To the Cyprus, again and again, Tribute to Salvador Espriu, uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. combining translations, poetry, and memoir in homage to Catalan Spain's most revered writer, was published in 2023. Cassell teaches in the MFA program at Texas State University, where he is a Regents professor, a professor and University Distinguished Professor of English. Um, all right, so it is with great pleasure that oh, I also you. introduce Cyrus Cassell. I think the reading might be shorter than the intro there. Thank you so much. Adroit has been wonderfully supportive of my recent projects and books and has interviewed me. So it's with great pleasure that I celebrate this latest issue. I'm going to start with the poem that's in the issue. It's called Siege of White. It's inspired by a poem by the great mid 20th century Italian poet Cesare Pavese. The poem is called Landscape Six. I've been obsessed with it for years, and I finally decided to just dive into it and move it around and turn it into a playground. Siege of White. The immense white morning blossoms into a spacious silence, muffling the workaday voices of passers-by. In this handsome metropolis, the dawn haze fuses every element of standstill green, every forest-tinted syllable. Even the wine in this punch clock kingdom tastes of fog. All at once, some bedless, paperless wanderer, some empty-bellied pipe dreamer pauses to imbibe the will-o'-the-wisp air, as if it were a hearty swallow of invigorating grappa. Whether you're semi-starved or nimbly ensnared by the sweetest mouth, it's worth your while to stroll in this immense ethereal siege of white. 
feeling your inchoate memories quicken with each new breath. Every household facade, every animal-loved esplanade, subsumed by marshalling fog, retains a shiver from the long ago that instills a gripping well. feeling. You can't shake this encompassing calm, rife with pertinent details. Peppery clues, in fact. From the epic, you first encountered a chatty Vesper Jay, a thrilling parapet walk, or a home oak's light latent salient branches. When the massive fog veers from the impressive river's current, maybe a scruffy truant forgets for a single moment his blunt hard scrabble life, the flummoxing hurdles and snapped in half promises. As he dawdles at a weather-worn corner, gauging the prehensile morning air. It's worth your while, the runaway senses and decides, this weird ad hoc business of returning like a regretful cat's paw on a brisk procedural or the prodigal son in the Bible. Even though rough and tumble flight, Hajira from stringent home has left you forever changed. Um, two more poems. This is a new poem. Um, years ago, I did uh, Julia Cameron's morning pages from her artist's way. Anybody, anybody do that? And um, you get up in the morning, you write really quickly, and then you, you set it aside for weeks or months at a time. But by looking at my morning pages, I discovered I was obsessed with light and shadow, which was something I had no consciousness about. So this is about that discovery in that spring. Chiaroscuro springtime. That was a season I couldn't think or write indoors. The garrulous springtime, every strophe, every felicitous story's pulse could only be crafted in tranquil cloisters, illuminating belvederes, or rambling villas. Luckily, it was an unbridled spring, all immoderate daisies and sunlit pediments, a bustling April, May, and June that engendered boyish safaris and burgeoning wonder. From my morning pages, unhampered writing designed as a treasure trove for the mind, I grasped like a low-key Sherlock a post-winter mystery, my own offhand fascination with rampant shadows and light. It gave me telltale pleasure to contemplate the marigold blaze and lamp-black elements of myriad Roman landscapes. And I revered from my galvanizing bedroom balcony, the mother church of the world, the fascinating shadows of phenomenal saints on San Giovanni and Laterano's facade. As I mused on how meticulously Renaissance painters rendered light, depth, and dimension in an elected Florentine scenario, I also recall Chekhov's imperative. Don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken tooth glass. Finally, my shadow and sunray odyssey spurred me to study Caravaggio's Narcissus, Chiaro Scuro, in which the lake bank gazer with rolled up linen sleeves, the lithe woodland god, can't be dislodged from the inkwell beauty of the dark water, cradling his spellbinding iridescent reflection. And now he kisses the deceitful fount, and now he thrusts his arms to catch the neck that's pictured in the middle of the stream. I have brash Caravaggio, Baroque necromancer, condemned to die brawler, masterful aerialist of battling craft and savagery to instruct my curious firsthand soul how in this contrapuntal spectacular Roman spring, so help me the thicket black shadow of my 
upwelling joy deepens my joy. And one more poem. The final poem of my new book, Is There Room for Another Horse on Your Horse Ranch? It's an elegy. The title is actually from Jack Gilbert. The title is uh, a line from one of Jack Gilbert's poems. It's called, I Believe Icarus Was Not Failing As He Fell. You just died in my arms, but suddenly it seems we're eternal. Cali boys, Afro-haired cohorts in crime, racing through intricate lattices of quince and lemon tree shadows, corridors of Queen Anne's lace. On the skip church Sunday, you dub me Sir Sirius instead of Cyrus. Then, swift as a deer's leap, we're devotees of goatees and showy Guatemalan shirts, intoxicated lovers for a month on the northwest coast of Spain, praising the irrepressible sounds of a crusty Galician bagpiper on La Coruña's gripping Finisterre, then gossiping and climbing like the giddy Argonauts we were, the lofty ancient Roman lighthouse, all the way, keep on trucking, we sang to the top of the Tower of Hercules. Thanks so much. Thank you. Wow, thank you to Cyrus Cassells. That was a wonderful way to kick off the evening. Loved all of those luscious, luscious details and um, definitely appreciate all the lines that people have pointed out in the chat box. And also must say that, is there room for another horse on your horse ranch is a wonderful title. Um, so with that wonderful first reading, I am now extremely happy to introduce our second reader, Polly Atkin. Polly Atkin is a multi-award winning poet, essayist, nature writer, and academic in the UK. Her biography, Recovering Dorothy, The Hidden Life of Dorothy Wordsworth, Sarah Bond 2021, is the first to focus on Dorothy's later life and illness. Her work is included in anthologies of nature writing, eco-poetry, and walking literature, including the UK's first anthology of nature writing by disabled and chronically ill writers. Moving Mountains, footnote 2023. In 2022, she became a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and continues to work from her home in Grasmere in the English Lake District. Um, so welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you to everyone at Adroit for um, including this piece in this issue. It means so much to me. Um, so this is an extract um, from my book, Some of Us Just Fall, um, which is a memoir about chronic illness. And it's kind of mix of memoir and nature writing. Um, and it's coming out in the States uh, with Unnamed on March the 19th. Um, so I'm gonna transport you for a few minutes to my home here in the Lake District um, in May, when we have very different weather to the winter storm that is going on tonight here. It is an early evening in early May. I go for a swim in the lake and it is glorious. I go in feeling sad and defeated, and the water does what it does. It holds me up. It shows me myself with a filter of sunlight and the odd clarity of lake light. It reflects me back at myself, shows me flying above the fells and through the blue sky, how the sky is also in the water. It reminds me the body breathes in the in-between, in the neither one nor the otherness of the warmer water just below the membrane of the lake's surface, that the body breaches this surface, links water and air, that the body is only one creature amongst many, that the body is permeable. The leaky cup of the body overflows and is refilled by the leaky cup of the lake, that permeability is life. What it doesn't do is heal me, 
what it doesn't do is make me better. Swimming does what it always does. It moves my muscles and joints gently and without the drag of gravity making my blood pool in my hands and legs. It allows me to move more easily, less painfully. It lets me feel joy in movement. What it doesn't do is erase the pain. Not during the swim, certainly not after. In Brilliant Imperfection, Eli Clare describes the ambiguity of cure, how cure is slippery, how cure saves lives, cure manipulates lives, cure prioritizes some lives over others, cure makes profits, cure justifies violence. That it is embedded in understandings of normal and abnormal, natural and unnatural. The cure requires damage, and locates the damage only in the individual. That the belief in cure tethers us not only to what we remember of our embodied selves in the past, but also to what we hope for them in the future. Cure relies on undoing the abnormal, the invalid, the defective, and restoring the healthy, the whole, the natural. Depending on your relationship to the past and future, Cure is either a fantasy or a threat. Every time I crawl out of the water, it is like pushing through a stage of evolution again, when that evolution only makes you unfit for purpose. Discussing this with E, a year-round swimmer, a genuine lover of the cold, she says that knees prove the implausibility of intelligent design. They aren't fit for purpose. Every time I come out of the water, gravity falls on me so hard, I'm not sure I can get myself upright, to pile one joint back on top of another. Standing, the pain of downward pressure reestablishes itself. The pain in my hip, or my foot, or my ankle, or my shoulder. Ah, yes, this is my body after all. Claire unpicks cure to its root as restoration, as an effort to turn back time, that it grounds itself in an original state of being, relying on a belief that what existed before is superior to what exists currently. A few years ago, I worked on a collaboration with a climate biologist for a poetry project on climate change. The scientist told me you can never truly restore a habitat, just make a different one. She was talking about Fenland restoration, she used the phrase, not better, not worse, just different. Or that's how I wrote it down. One set of insects will have died or dispersed as their old habitat was removed. After restoration, a new set comes in. Different, not better, not worse. Never the same. You can't go backwards in time, she told me. Cure assumes there was a time when things were unproblematically well to go back to when the body was benign, polite, did as it was asked with enthusiasm and courtesy. I don't have such a time to return to, not in my body. Say the body is a body of earth, a small planet in which we live like a molten core or, no, a mycelial network in the soil. What is it to be restored? The ideology of cure makes a cultivated garden of the body a small holding, a landscaped park. It wants the body weeded, the soil enriched, the pests controlled. It wants the high yield of the body, the neat verges of the body, the municipal lawns of the body mowed into tidy strips, the flower beds of the body, tulips blooming in intricate patterns, just as planned. But the body was never a garden, unless by garden you mean the beginning of everything our first and only home, the place we've been sent out of, though I don't believe in this origin story. Now I see talk of rewilding the body, but this too is only an attempt to restore a health you think you lost when you put up all of those fences, when you pulled up the growth you designated unproductive. You think wildness will save you. You think nature is essentially good and fair. 
nature doesn't care about the integrity of your wild body. If it restores you to wildness, it will be through feeding you into the earth. I'll leave it there on that happy night. <laughs> Thank you all. It's been such a pleasure already, Cyrus. It was wonderful to hear you. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for sharing your poetry. Um, what a wonderful space for meditation was just created there and all of these wonderful lines. Um, thank you everyone also for sharing. Um, all right, so on that note, I am happy to welcome our next reader, uh, Hadara Barnadov. Hadara Barnadov is an NEA fellow and award-winning author of several books of poetry, among them, The Animal is Chemical, The New Nudity, Lullaby with Exit Sign, and The Frame Called Ruin, as well as the chapbooks Fountain and Furnace and Show Me Yours. She is also co-author with Michelle Boisseau of the best-selling textbook Writing Poems, 8th edition. Her poems have appeared in the American Poetry, Re uh, American Poetry Re Review, The Believer, Kenyan Review, The New Republic, Plowshares, Poetry, and elsewhere. Hadara is a professor of English and teaches in the MFA program at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, so pleased to have you with us. Thank you so much for the lovely intro. Um, Polly, I, I, um, you left me wordless. All I could come up with in the chat was wow. And I'm like, way to feel really articulate right before I'm going to give a reading. Um, I just, I, I don't know if our, let, let's say our brilliant adroit editors um, did this on purpose because my, my newest book, The Animal is Chemical, is about intergenerational trauma, healing, uh, pharmaceuticals, the medical industry. Um, and uh, so all these lights were going off in my head as you were reading. A pleasure to hear you and Cyrus as well. Um, so um, thank you so much to the Adroit um, Journal. It's my first time in the issue. So I'm delighted to also celebrate uh, the first time in the journal. So uh, wonderful to celebrate this issue with you all. And also, um, I'm celebrating my brand new book. I just got copies of it. The Animal is Chemical just out from Four Way Books. Um, I've just been reading from paper for so long. It feels um, awesome and amazing to actually hold a book. I'm like, there you are. You've been years in the making and now you're a thing. Fabulous. So um, I'm going to start out with a poem called um, I Took the Drugs. I took the drugs marked sleep for sleep, and the drugs marked joy to trudge through grief, and the yellow drugs to crack my Vaseline smile, ooze trickling the length of my spine, the hair on my arms electrically charged. The stop my mind from shaking drugs for blood dip dreams, the stop crying drugs that left me hazed in a hangover for empty weeks, the taste of copper licking my lips. I took the drugs for side effects, the drugs for drugs, bottle shape they shoved me in, body of sludge. Call me the great undead with a pharmaceutical edge and a head full of mud. But I believe, if I believe hard enough, if I am a believer on my knees, praying for ease, oblivion, please, the pink circle by day, blue ovoid by night, white pearl for when my chest ruptures into flame, lullabied by the dead and the history of the dead, my wounds flickering beneath my skin. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read a couple poems um, for my father, whose birthday is coming up in a couple weeks. He passed away. Uh, almost 16 years ago from uh, complications related to Lyme disease. Uh, this, and I also saw that my sister was in the audience and um, it's nice to see my family out there. Um, this is Prayer with Percocet. Lost in a cemetery again, a maze of losses. Section C, row six, plot 18. Red roses, rows of endings, 
and the scent of oranges. At the center, I am surrounded by stone. Leave a pebble behind. Didn't I hope a pill would keep my father's heart alive forever? Didn't I hope a pill would take care of it? The gods of science were wrong. Ghosts floating off in their white coats. What can you do for me, ghost-colored pill, asleep in my pocket? Miniature moon who could crush me, who is almost good. In the morning, I check the label and see my own face in flames. One pill and I can watch my pain from ac across the room. I slowly slide my breath between the knives in my neck, my sunrise of painkillers, blood orange. Um, so this is a poem harness um, uh, that, uh, that is appearing in a droid um, in the new issue. Um, it's, it might be self-explanatory, but um, my, my father did die on another continent and in the he died in Israel and in the Jewish tradition, um, you bury within 24 hours and um, none of my uh, siblings or I could actually get to Israel in time for the funeral, which was uh, just uh, something, a difficulty I've been wrestling with for 16 years and running. Harness. I take the word in my teeth and want to sever its hiss. Hard harp hit. Black leather strap or gravity's heavy body, smothered in violet shade. Say it, shame. Blanket of fire that is my skin on a Sunday afternoon. Sunny out, shivering and uncalm. Alarm, alarm. Cardinals unzipper the sky, making it fall by halves. Little knives, I can feel each one. When my father died on another continent, I did not see him in time. Black eye shine. A series of strokes and a feeding tube. Rasp of his voice, high as a young girl's. Dying into the fluorescent absence of no one there, its bright humming. Time was another day, day, another hour, hour, over. Before and after, and then always after. Gray tilt of Sundays sliding sideways. Father all evening strapped to the anchor, gone. So um, I was a medical editor for many years and worked on a lot of different drugs, some of which were good and some of which were not good, but we had to sell them anyway. The ethics of this is part of why I left that industry for good. Um, so uh, I've always wanted to come up with something I could do with my weird pharmaceutical knowledge. And I embarked on a series of poems based on medications my family had taken in the last few years. Um, and I take pharmaceutical package inserts and turn them into erasure poems. So this is um, Your Mind is Night from the treat annoying gel or retin-A package insert. And for what it's worth, um, it turns out that you are actually flammable when you use retin-A, so sh you shouldn't uh, smoke. Um, see, there's weird um, important information in package inserts, which regular people wouldn't read and they're written in a way that is unintelligible. So even if you tried, you might not know what's going on anyway. But um, anyway, here's the poem. Your mind is night. Your eyes open wounds. Your whole face may become skeletal. 
Fire is your nature. Flame is your friend. Deep inside your skin, New Zealand white rabbits report excessively troublesome feelings of warmth, inflammatory lesions, healing of the total body surface, a red blistered day. Question your toxic nature. Question the human risk. Death is excreted in human milk with alcohol, spices, and lime. You can't wash it away. Use extreme caution. You are flammable. Interestingly, like most of the words that are connected to fire in the pharmaceutical package insert are actually italicized so, so that it's a huge warning. But again, unless you opened up that tiny little cube that's folded into origami stuck to the side of your, your um, medication, you wouldn't know that, except now that I have brought it up, maybe. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm just looking at the time, so I'm just going to read one more of the erasures and wrap up. This is Trust Us, which is based on the cyclobenzaprine or flexural patient and prescribing information from Medline Plus. Trust us. Relax, relax, relax. Relax the brain and nervous system, the mouth. Swallow your heart. Swallow it with applesauce. Swallow without chewing. Your heart has a history of failure. Your heart is a blue gelatin sphere consumed by red thoughts. Admit hearing voices that do not exist. Carry them with you. Pain comes to crush and eat you. Ask your doctor and pharmacist to keep you safe. Stroke your face with tenderness like a child. Thank you. Wow, um, maybe that should be the reaction to every reader tonight because that was just electrifying and thank you so much for sharing those electrifying poems with all of us. Um, and also the pharmaceutical knowledge, um, that was crazy. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and with that, um, very, very happy to introduce our next reader, Kyle Dargan. Um, Kyle Dargan is the books editor for Janelle Bonet's creative company, Wonderland, Panzer Hertz, A Live Dissection, Northwestern slash Tricorderly 2023, will be his sixth and final poetry collection. Um, so welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, thank you all. Can you hear me? Is my mic working? Yep. Yes. <laughs> OK, great. Sorry, it was giving me trouble earlier today, so I was really scared. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, of course, I, I I love Adroit. It's one of the the few places that I still send my work, um, and I'm just really happy to be here um, in this this space with all this talent and so many writers that I admire um, and have taught too. You know, it's, it's just great. Uh, so I'm gonna read the poem from uh, the new issue, if that's okay. Uh, and again, since my last book will be my last book, this will probably be the only place this poem ever uh, appears, uh, and I'm cool with that. So uh, the piece is titled, Don't You Run From the Lord. <clears throat> it's an epigraph from uh, hip hop artist, Open Mike Eagle, which is, this is a prayer and you should aim it where you need to. I've seen God chase down a comet, not even breathing hard, not even breathing, because what is breath to God? What do you know about that life, about speed beyond respiratory systems and lactic acid, about a body that might as well be a blink, how a hummingbird could feel instead like a land seal lumbering, trying to pivot 
and dodge God's call. Imagine this is why the universe keeps expanding, why it stretches. It is chasing the voice of God. Your galaxy has been getting cooked, dusted, all that stuff floating around in the dark heat void. That's the universe going catabolic, fissuring in the non-existent hope of rotating in pace. So who are you to run, human? It is not enough for me to call you snail, call you stalactite. Computers boosted your search speed, but to God, you are slower than an addled processor. Every internet tab open on the hunt for a shortcut or a way away. You should close the windows, save yourself, drop the thread, little Theseus, and give it, it, you, up to God. To God who had to send someone as stone-footed, as mud-tongued as me, to politely now ask you not bother hoofing and huffing, that you wade your ears into this wake of God exhaust. That crackling, it is not static. This whole time you have been within the blaze you thought you were outrunning. Um, I will read one piece from the last book, Pens or Hers. Um, it's just how to love be a slow moving storm. Love come cast your body across the city, burgeoning and rubenesque. Your gaze trained to the west from whence you came, where you gathered. Bared flesh in churn, love, give not a damn for our commutes. Love, make from second sloshing cubic feet. Transform intersections into stalling pits. Conjure rivers from roads. None of us die from drowning. We are born and bred submerged. We stumble away from our mothers, forgetting how to huff any substance of it but air. Love, fill the lungs underneath the city. Flush our toxins into the bay. Then beckon back the bay, love. Take our sidewalks in a surge, bathe we in we. You know I am in no rush to be anything but this breathing conundrum, an inorganic anomaly known as personhood. But observe, love, the dust of me is already rising as it seeks some heaven, hoping to atomize, flock and perch on parched high ground, scalp fleck and eyelash, and lip chaff and exhaust, exhaust from heart and lungs, all wanting to become finch and egret and canary, hawk and loon. So love, suppress their lifting from me. Be there no aviaries above you. Come slowly, draping rain's chain mail around my body. May nothing pierce or leave my skin. Keep my ghosts subdued and, if it must be, drunk, an evaporation risk. Love, we live between two seas, both current racked and hemmed at the offings. May you, love, wind tear our world along those creased edges. Discard all of this packaging, this infrastructure wilted upon the earth. Um, this last thing I'll read, uh, I told myself I needed to write about joy. Um, and one of the things that brings me joy is Star Wars. So I'm writing this new book of prose about Star Wars. Uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, and I'm just giving myself that because I deserve it. So this last piece, uh, has a title I'm sure many people are familiar with. It is, um, if you only knew the power of the dark side. Um, and again, uh, thank you for this opportunity to read tonight. If you only knew the power of the dark side. 
are respites from the city's summer heat islands were known to be the spoils of white, the Hoffian air conditioning that cranked from the drug dealer's sedans while cups and hands we move through stoplight traffic, bumming for funds to feed our youth swim team. The drug dealer's whips, Vader black, burnished and tint rich. And there I would stop caring about retrieving any of their coins. I just wanted those moments to hang my head at their drop driver side windows while the brittle vent wind broke against my sweaty skin. There was no question then. I could feel the power. I could imagine why, with concrete making afternoon burn like we live between two suns, that someone might desire conscription into a drug war. I could sense a bit of the rebel leaving my body each time. There was no need of the dark side. That cold, from their cars was force enough to give me visions of an empire of white. Thank you. Wow, um, that was such great, powerful poetry. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm sure many people, uh, myself included, found themselves hanging on to every word of the reading. Thank you. And now um, I am also pleased to introduce our next reader, Shanna Tan. Shanna Tan is a Singaporean translator working from Korean, Chinese, and Japanese into English. She was selected for two emerging literary translator mentorships in 2022, where she was mentored by Anton Her and Julia Sanchez. Her prose translations have appeared in the Southern Review, The Common, Azealia Journal of Korean Literature and Culture, and more. So thank you, Shanna Tan, and we're very pleased to have you with us today. Thank you so much. So welcome to the Hyunam Dong Bookshop. It's a debut novel by South Korean author Hwang bo -rum, and it's also my first book-length translation. And um, this is the UK edition. And Bloomsbury will be publishing this on Mixed Bunch in the US. So just a little bit about the book. So Yongju, a woman who is suffering from burnout, leaves behind her job, her family, friends, and open an independent bookshop in a quiet neighborhood in Seoul. And we journey with her as she heals, and her bookshop turns into an inviting space for lost souls to rest, to heal, and remember that it's never too late to scrap the plot and start again. So I'll be reading um, a little bit from the start of the novel. A man was loitering outside the bookshop. Stooping slightly, he shaded his eyes and peered through the window. He had mistaken the opening time and come too early. As she walked towards the bookshop, Yongju recognized the man from behind. He was a regular customer who would drop by two or three evenings a week, always in a business suit. Hello. Startled, the man turned his head sharply. At the sight of Yongju, he quickly lowered his hands and straightened up, grinning sheepishly. I usually come in the evenings. First time I'm here at this time, he said. Yongju smiled at him. Well, not sure about other things, but I'm definitely envious that you start work at lunchtime, he quipped. She laughed. I get that a lot. At the beeps of the passcode being punched on the keypad, the man looked away and turned back only at the click of the door. His face relaxed upon glimpsing the interior through the crack. Pushing the door wide open, she turned to him. It's going to smell a little of the night air and books. If you don't mind, you're welcome inside. The man stepped back, waving his palms. No, no, I'm good. I'll hate to bother you, especially outside business hours. I'll come by again. Yong just stood by the door and watched his retreating figure before turning into the bookshop. The moment she stepped inside, she relaxed, as if her body and senses basked in the comfort of returning to her workplace. In the past, 
she used to live by mantras like passion and willpower, as if by imprinting the words on her mind, they would somehow breathe meaning into her life. Then one day, she realized it felt like she was driving herself into a corner, and she resolved never to let those words dictate her life again. Instead, she learned to listen to her body, her feelings, and be in happy places. She would ask herself these questions. Does this place make me feel positive? Can I be truly whole and uncompromisingly myself? Do I love and treasure myself here? And for Yongju, the bookshop checked all the boxes. It was a sweltering day, but before she could turn on the aircon, she needed to expel the stale air of yesterday and let fresh air in. When do I escape from the past, or is that a futile task? An unbreakable habit, the negativity reared its ugly head to drag her down, but she quickly pushed back with happier thoughts. Warm, humid air rushed in as she opened the windows one by one. Fanning herself with a hand, she surveyed the bookshop. Questions swirled in her mind. If this were her first visit, would she have faith in the staff's recommendations? How does a bookshop earn trust? And what makes a good bookshop? The wall of novels in the bookshop was her way of coming full circle to fulfill her childhood dream. In elementary school, little Yongju pestered her dad to line all four walls in her room with storybooks. Each time her dad would admonish her, saying that it wouldn't do for her to be so greedy, even when it came to books. She knew he wasn't angry and was just trying to break her habit of throwing tantrums to get what she wanted. But still, she would burst into tears at his stern demeanor, and later, tired from crying, she would curl up and fall asleep in his embrace. Shifting her weight away from the bookcase she had been leaning against, Yongju walked to the windows and closed them one by one, starting as usual from the rightmost. With the last window firmly shut, she switched on the air con and put on her favorite album, Keens, Hopes and Fears. The album was released back in 2004, but she had only discovered the British band last year. It was love at first listen. Since then, she put it on almost every day. The languid and dreamy voice filled the air as a new day at Hyunam Dong Bookshop began. Next to the counter, Yongju sat down at her desk and checked her inbox for new online orders. The next thing to do was to run through the to-do list she had prepared the night before. It was a habit from high school that carried well over to an adult life. To write down the task she needed to do the following day, starting with the most important one. Years later, she still maintained the habit, albeit with a different purpose. Her younger self had wanted to rule her day with an iron fist. Now, Yongju soothed herself with the list. Running through the tasks she needed to work on gave her confidence that it would be another day well spent. For the first few months after the bookshop's opening, she had completely forgotten about lists and long-time habits. Each day passed by in a blur of struggles, as if time had slammed to a halt. Before she started the bookshop, it had been even worse, as if something was siphoning her soul away. Or maybe it was more accurate to say she was not herself at all. There was only one thing on her mind. I must open a bookshop. Okay, so I would read um, until this bit, but I wanted to read a little bit more from the author's note because it really encapsulates what she wanted to um, express through this novel. Okay, so this bit is from the author's note. While I didn't plan out the plot before starting to write, I knew the atmosphere I wanted to create. I wanted to write a novel evoking the mood of Kamome Diner and Little Forest. A place we can escape to, a refuge from the intensity of daily life where we can't even pause to take a breather. A place to shelter us from the harsh criticisms 
whipping us to do more, to go faster. A space to snuggle comfortably for a day. A day without something siphoning our energy. A day to replenish what's lost. A day we begin with anticipation and end with satisfaction. A day where we grow and from growth sprouts hope. A day spent having meaningful conversations with good people. Most importantly, a day where we feel good and our heart beats strongly. I wanted to write about such a day and the people within it. Yeah, so thank you so much. And this will be coming out in the US next month. Thank you for the opportunity to read. Um, well, thank you, Shanna. Um, thank you for the wonderful reading of your translation and sharing the author's extremely hopeful message. And um, we are all looking very much forward to seeing the book in our bookstores, uh, bookshops very soon. Um, so with that, um, I'm excited to introduce our next reader, Robert Wood Lynn. Robert Wood Lynn is a poet from Virginia. His debut collection, Mothman Apologia, Yale University Press, was the winner of the Yale Younger Poets Prize and the Kate Tufts Discovery Award. His work has appeared in American Poetry, American Poetry Review, Poetry, Poetry Daily, The Harvard Review, and other publications. A 2023 NEA Creative Writing Fellow, he splits his time between Rockbridge County, Virginia, and New York City, where he teaches creative writing at Juilliard. Um, welcome. We're very happy that you're here with us. I shine. Summer returning as consolation. It's light, impolite, and almost possible to ignore. You called to me from the other room to no answer. Slow and sweetly frantic. A cat splaying its paw back and forth under a closed door. I don't remember what you asked. What kind of tea did I want to forget on a shelf? I was frozen in front of your poem, the way my neighbor used to spotlight deer specifically to shoot them. It was summer. We were loved. The cat, too. This light almost possible. I wanted, I want to be loved again like that. The antlers mounted on his wall. Thank you guys so much for bringing me in. It's um, always a thrill to have a poem in Adroit. Uh, it's a journal that I've been reading for a very long time. Um, and uh, so th that was I Shine, which is the first of two poems in this issue. Uh, I'll read uh, three more poems, the next of which was is also uh, in this uh, issue of Adroit. Auld Lang Sign. The year turned itself out and I miss the having of good secrets. The beginning of love, a stowaway, and even the most mundane interactions. News about a man arrested for smuggling live hummingbirds stitched in his clothes on a long flight from South America. I left the party when I felt myself eavesdropping on my own conversations. It's hard not to believe people are at their most beautiful when sweating a little and leaning toward each other bodies licked like fawns with anticipation. The windows left open in protest of the accumulated heat of being, inviting the new January outside on in. All of that has its way, all of that has its way of disappearing in the white light of the customs office, the implied handcuffs of a windowless room. The man on the plane caught because he couldn't keep still a dozen tiny beaks against his skin, wanting something that wasn't him. An in your room off the kitchen, my name you kept repeating, the chorus of a song from a band getting by on haircuts and effect pedals. Thank you guys. Um, this uh, great uh, lineup of readers, I'm really thrilled to be reading with you all. Uh, this is uh, especially a thrill because um, I was a student of Kyle's and I was a student of Catherine's so uh, this is sort of a, a dream come true to, to get to read with two of my uh, favorite poets and teachers. So this is a, another new poem um, that'll be out next month in The Drift. This is an apology. 
I awoke. You weren't there, but there were horses on the beach. I got up, made believe nothing hurt, and my evidence was horses on the beach. Even though the beach horses were remarkably indifferent to the thrill of horses on the beach. I went about my day. I went for a run in the surf. The horses only sauntered, heads slung low as an apology. With my long hair flowing, I felt like I was nailing the audition for the part of horse on a beach, while the actual horses were just kind of phoning it in. You used to say you worked the way mountains do, turn bluer the further you got from me until you disappeared completely. I went to tell you about the horses. You were right. You disappeared completely. I still wanted to. I wrote it down just in case. And I'll just close out with one more poem. Um, this is a brand new poem, so it's not anywhere. Um, and this is a poem for my friend Alex. Commitment. Alex, do you think God appreciates us this time of year going out in knit maroons, black leather? I'm still no good at smoking, but I liked best the part of your party where people snuck outside in small groups, laughter and something else burning their effigies against the sharp air. Like you said of Provence, I had a horrible time, but I loved it. How the light there touched everything different. The way that first night he climbed into your bed and you traced a map of his back with your palms. This was the year you took to tiny crosses. Said of religion, it's not tone deaf, it's timeless. The year I took to crossing avenues in your honor, impulsively against the hand. Thank you so much. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, it was a joy to read. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing those transportive, evocative poems with us um thank you um with that um it is now time if i'm not incorrect for our last reader last but not least um very happy to introduce Catherine barnett Catherine barnett is the author of the collections solutions for the problem of bodies in space gray wolf press 2024 Human Hours, Grey Wolf Press 2018, The Game of Boxes, Grey Wolf Press 2012, which was the recipient of the 2012 James Laughlin Award from the, Acad the Academy of American Poets, and Into Perfect Spheres, Such Holes Are Pierced, Alice James Books 2004. She is the recipient, among other honors, of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a 2022 award in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She teaches in the creative writing program at New York University and lives in New York City, where she also works as an independent editor. Um, thank you for being with us today. Uh, welcome. Um. Hi, <laughs> Peter Laberge here, editor of Adroit. Uh, we are, I think, at the mercy of the New York City MTA. Uh, I, I don't believe Catherine Barnett is here. I don't think so. Catherine, are you here? <laughs> going once, going twice. Um, hmm, no one is in the waiting room. Um, hmm, I am not sure what, uh, whether Catherine, I know Catherine said that she was going to teach, uh, tonight and that she'd be joining us a little late. Um, but it seems that Catherine is unfortunately not here. Um, I'm just let's see. Well, <laughs> improv time. Um, hmm. I 
think it makes sense to read Catherine's poems that uh, will appear in the issue. I um, had the wonderful fortune of having Catherine as my thesis advisor um, at NYU, where I did my MFA, as I'm sure potentially a couple other people in this um, in this Zoom audience uh, might have also had Catherine as their thesis advisors at NYU. Uh, she carries an infectious uh, passion for close revision as well as wild and also quite simple uh, daily engagement with the written word. So I am such a wonderful fan of Catherine Barnett, and I'm so thrilled to have her in this issue, even if she is being kept by the New York City subway system, which is the most New York thing in the world. I can attest to that myself, um, although I am coming to you from my messy apartment. Sorry, I've been traveling uh, it, from Philadelphia, but I am pleased to read uh, two poems from Catherine Barnett. Although I'm also thinking, uh, Chris Crowder, maybe do you want to read the second one? Uh, Chris Crowder is our managing editor and um, Adroy definitely takes a village to uh, to keep publishing work and to keep the lights on as it were. So, um, so I will read Catherine's poem, Art History, and I will also share it, uh, share my screen just because I can. <laughs> Um, so here we are, Art History by Catherine Barnett. I'm scared, Yayoi Kusama cried out. Somebody, please come. This was the 1980s in New York City, and you know who lay beside her to soothe her? An Kawara, who destroyed his painting every night at midnight if he hadn't finished it yet. I am still alive, he wrote in his telegrams, which he considered works of art. And they were, and now he's not, and now it's past midnight. I haven't begun to finish. Finish what? The two mangoes that soften conspicuously? Going through my papers, this draft? In class, I told my students, listen, I'm not the doctor of clarity but I am trying to be clear. Ankawara is no longer alive. The city air smells like urine. We are each one of us autonomous nervous systems of yearning. Last year, I stood in a long line to enter Yayoi Kusama's infinity mirrored room, a darkened 10 by 12 room lined with mirrors, strung with LED lights and acrylic balls and for the allotted time, I saw myself repeated into infinity, which is different from the task at hand, which is to accept finitude. I have two irises, two nipples, a first, a middle, and a last name. It's not like I've ever wished for more. I have no trouble tossing out the shishito peppers or the dry cleaner's handwritten tag with an ex's name still flashing its safety pin. I kept the safety pin. Was it climbing the stairs that kept me from Kusama's other room longing for eternity? Or was it a question of time? This year, I didn't even have time for Valentine's Day, though I liked looking around at all the little dogs and their rubber booties and their passing faces, some of which surely will be models for paintings no one buys at estate sales that seem more frequent now. Terribly frequent. I am still alive, and the estate liquidators keep flooding my inbox. Some charge a flat rate fee. Others work by percentages and let you choose your own date. Put me down for not yet. Like everyone else, I didn't want to leave the infinity room. The guard knocks and says it's time to go while upstairs the line usually moves more quickly. 
From what I can tell, longing for eternity is not an immersive experience. You just peek in. There is no God. There is no guard to accompany you, no guide to ferry you along. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen because I saw Catherine, I think, wander in. Yay, she's here. Um, welcome, Catherine. I am going to pin you, and you're here, and we're so excited about it, and I'm going to shut up. <laughs> Oh, but you're muted. <laughs> I'm so sorry, you guys. I um, I was teaching in the, in the very room in which I first met Peter. So that was a, a huge joy to hear you read. But I heard the last half of that poem, and you read it much better than I could read it. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I'm sorry I missed the reading. I was in, in a classroom. Um, so it was especially funny to hear you hear, to hear you read about the the Doctor of Clarity. Should I read the other poem that's in your magazine or should I read something else? You can read whatever you want. <laughs> okay, did, did you just read that first poem? I, yeah, I did. Okay, okay, I, I can't. Nice <laughs> okay, I'm gonna switch to gallery view. Oh, yeah. hello, hello everybody. Okay, so I'll read um, uh, um, the other poem that's gonna be in this current issue of Adroit is called Awe and it's set, um, at the Museum of Natural History. So these are both New York poems. <laughs> um, it's called Awe. Celebratory, gently automatopoetic, almost indecorous. The words were a pleasure to repeat. Everyone said it, the whole shebang. But, but if what Skeet said was true, if shebang first meant temporary shelter, if all of it is only temporary. I didn't like to think about it. Beneath the blue whale at the Museum of Natural History, I understood I was a small lone figure swept up in waves. The whale wore 600 pounds of paint. I wore waterproof mascara and geox, the metal eyelets flickering on the floor beneath her 10 tons. I wore those shoes everywhere, but did not wear through their breathable membrane, which someone thought to patent. Isn't it wonderful that the souls breathe like all animals, like the speechless human animal bending now to double knot the laces as the black sneakers collect dust? the dust of exhalation, exaltation. It seemed everything was breathing, even the blue skylights with their blue bulbs, the passers-by in the vast family hall. Beneath her body, we walked beside other bodies. We walked away, we planned to return, safe in our temporary chambers. Thank you. Oh, th that's all I'm going to read. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much for um, the wonderful reading and also for um, uh, making it here, uh, even though the, I don't know if Peter said something about the New York uh, metro system. Um, being particularly difficult to deal with. Um, but yes, that was a those are two wonderful, wonderful readings. And we are so happy to have um, heard both of the poems um, that are going to be coming, um, that are going to be appearing in the next issue. Um, and I would like to also take this opportunity to once again thank everybody who has read tonight and also everybody who showed up um, to share um, and listen to and show your appreciation for uh, poetry, for fiction, for nonfiction, for literature. Um, thank you all for coming and supporting Adroit. Thank you again to the Adroit team for all the work um, put into putting out this issue. And yeah, I guess that is it for tonight. Thank you all so, so, so much, uh, especially our wonderful readers. And the issue will be released uh, very, very soon.